A question I get from a lot of individuals is what is Agile? So today we're going to take a look at what exactly Agile is. Agile is many different things to different individuals. It depends on who you ask. But one thing should be true across all definitions of Agile. And it is the fact that Agile is not just about software and technology. Agile is not a way of developing anything. First and foremost, Agile is a way of thinking. So we're going to define Agile today. And a simple definition is Agile is first and foremost an adaptable, value-driven way of thinking. So I want you to begin to think of Agile as a way you think. Think in an Agile fashion. Think in an adaptable fashion. Thinking in an Agile fashion means not being bound to a plan, but being ready to adapt as the plan may need to change. A favorite quote is from Mike Tyson, and it says, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. Someone who is agile understands that and is ready to adapt based on what is happening in the environment. Agile is not about software. Agile is first and foremost an adaptable value-driven way of thinking. Agile is an adaptable value-driven way of thinking and processing empirical data into valuable information. What do we mean by that? When we say empirical data, we mean data that is real, not bogus data, not data that is from other processes or environments outside of ours. We're talking about data generated from our experience, experiential data. So in Agile, we process that data into valuable information. Data becomes information through lean-driven analysis. In other words, we keep it as simple and just barely enough. And we use that to enable iterative improvements to deliverable development processes. Now, when we think agilely, not only are we thinking about deliverable development processes, we should also be thinking about our improvement as a team our improvement as the individuals who are working the processes. Now, these iterative improvements should generate the most favorable and valuable outcome for the customer. In the world of Agile, we are obsessed with the customer's satisfaction. So Agile does not mean software, IT, and technology, though it could be used to develop software and systems. That is not what Agile is. Primarily, agile first and foremost is a way of thinking. I often say you can detect an agile thinker and an agile process, method, or framework a mile away using the simple manifesto litmus test. In the world of agile, we should be focusing on data from our experiences, from our team's experiences, data that is generated from stuff that we actually did. And that is the empirical data that we are going to process to enable us glean information through lean-driven analysis. What do we mean by lean-driven analysis? We mean just barely enough. What will get us to our goal is all we want to do. Not any more, not any less. Lean-mindedness pervades agile. So we could say while we're thinking adaptably and we're processing this empirical data into valuable information through our lean-driven analysis, whatever those analyses may be, we are looking to enable iterative improvements to deliverable development processes. In other words, we want to get better and better at what we do. We want to go through those cycles, just like the PDCA cycle, plan, do, check, act. But at the end, we want to think about how can we get better. That's what Agile is all about. I love this one from the Agile Alliance. And honestly, it's an organization you should go look into. Take a look at the Agile Alliance website. Agile, they say, is the ability to create and respond to change. It is a way of dealing with and ultimately succeeding in an uncertain and turbulent environment. The authors of the Agile Manifesto chose Agile as the label for this whole idea because that word represented the adaptiveness and response to change, which was so important to the approach. It's really about thinking through how you can understand what's going on in the environment that you're in today. 
identify what uncertainty you're facing and figure out how you can adapt to that as you go along. Now, let's talk about Agile beginnings. If you go to agilemanifesto.org, there are many different pieces of that site, including the Agile Manifesto we'll take a look at. But let's get into a little bit of history regarding the Agile Manifesto. So paraphrasing this wonderful article written by Jim Highsmith, you might have heard of the Highsmith decision spectrum. Well, he wrote this lovely article, and I'm going to paraphrase it. On February 11th to 13th in 2001, 17 people met to talk, ski, relax, and to find common ground, and of course, to eat. What emerged was the Agile Software Development Manifesto. Representatives from XP, Scrum, DSDM, Adaptive Software Development, Crystal, Feature-Driven Development, and others, sympathetic to the need for an alternative to documentation-driven heavyweight software development processes, convened. Now, a bigger gathering of organizational anarchists would be hard to find. So what emerged from this meeting was symbolic, a manifesto for agile software development signed by all participants. As to Coburn's initial concerns reflected the early thoughts of many participants. I personally didn't expect that this particular group of agilites to ever agree on anything substantive. But his post-meeting feelings were also shared. Speaking for myself, I am delighted by the final phrasing of the manifesto. I was surprised that the others appeared equally delighted by the final phrasing. So for those of you who like to read the history of things, go on down to the Agile Manifesto website, look for the history. These folks named themselves the Agile Alliance. This group of independent thinkers about software development and sometimes competitors to each other, by the way, agreed on the manifesto for Agile software development displayed on the title page of the website I just referred you to. But while the manifesto provides some specific ideas, there is a deeper theme that drives many, but not all, to be sure, members of the Alliance. At the close of the two-day meeting, Bob Martin joked that he was about to make a mushy statement, but while tinged with humor, few disagreed with Bob's sentiment that we all felt privileged to work with a group of people who held a set of compatible values, a set of values based on trust and respect for each other, and promoting organizational models based on people, watch this, collaboration, and building the types of organizational communities in which we want to work. And that is at the core of this manifesto. And that is why when you look at the title, you could be misled to just see software development. But it's not about that. It's truly more far-reaching than that. And I dare say more far-reaching than these 17 awesome folks even imagined it would be. Because this is an approach. It's a philosophy to life. It's a philosophy to business. At the core, writes Jim, I believe agile methodologies are really about mushy stuff, about delivering good products to customers by operating an environment that does more than talk about people as our most important asset, but actually acts as if people were the most important and lose the word asset. So in the final analysis, meteoric rise of interest in and sometimes tremendous criticism of agile methodologies is about the mushy stuff. I have a saying, I often say the soft stuff is the tough stuff. And that is why agile is so wildly popular. For example, says Jim, I think that ultimately extreme programming has mushroomed in use and interest, not because of pair programming or refactoring, but because taken as a whole, the practices define a developer community free from the baggage of Dilbertesque corporations. Ken Beck tells the story of an early job in which he estimated a programming effort of six weeks for two people. After his manager reassigned the other program at the beginning of the project, he completed the project in 12 weeks and felt terrible about himself. The boss, of course, harangued Kent about how slow he was through the second six weeks. Kent, somewhat despondent because he was such a failure, as a programmer, finally realized that his original estimate of six weeks was extremely accurate for two people and that his failure was really the manager's failure. Indeed, the failure of the standard fixed process mindset that so frequently plagues our industry. You see, it is a mindset. So when we talk about agile, we're not just talking about development of a product, service, or result. No, that comes later on. Primarily, we're talking about a mindset, the way you think. 
This type of situation goes on every day, marketing or management or external customers, internal customers, and yes, even developers don't want to make hard trade-off decisions. So they impose irrational demands through the imposition of corporate power structures. This isn't merely a software development problem. It runs through Dilbertes corporations, organizations. In order to succeed in the new economy, to move aggressively into the era of e-business, e-commerce, and the web, companies, entire companies, we're not talking about individuals now, companies think at that high level, they have to rid themselves of their Dilbert manifestations of make, work, and arcane policies. This freedom from the inanities of corporate life attracts proponents of agile methodologies and scares the bejeebus <laughs> out of traditionalists. We'll spare that word. Quite frankly, the agile approaches scare corporate bureaucrats, at least those that are happy pushing process for process sake versus trying to do the best for the customer and deliver something timely and tangible as promised because they run out of places to hide. The Agile movement is not anti-methodology. In fact, many of us want to store credibility to the word methodology. We want to restore a balance. We embrace modeling, but not in order to file some diagram in a dusty corporate repository. We embrace documentation, but not hundreds of pages of never maintained and rarely used tomes. We plan and recognize the limits of planning in a turbulent environment. Those who would brand proponents of XP or Scrum or any of the other agile methodologies as hackers are ignorant of both the methodologies and the original definition of the term hacker. The meeting at Snowbird was incubated at an earlier get-together of extreme programming proponents and a few outsiders organized by Kent Beck at the Rogue River Lodge in Oregon in the spring of 2000. In September 2000, Bob Martin from Object Mentor in Chicago started the meet next meeting ball rolling with an email. I'd like to convene a small two-day conference in the January to February 2001 timeframe here in Chicago. The purpose of this conference is to get all the lightweight method leaders in one room. All of you are invited, and I'd be interested to know who else I should approach. Bob set up a wiki site, and the discussions raged. Early on, Alistair Coburn weighed in with an epistle that identified the general disgruntlement with the word light. I don't mind the methodology being called light in weight, but I'm not sure I want to be referred to as a lightweight, attending a lightweight methodologist meeting. Trust Alistair, it's quite the character, isn't he? It somehow sounds like a bunch of skinny, feeble-minded, lightweight people trying to remember what day it is. The fiercest debate was over location. There was serious concern about Chicago in wintertime, cold and Nothing fun to do. Snowbird, Utah, cold, but fun things to do, at least for those who ski on their heads, like Martin Fowler tried one day on day one. So they went back and forth deciding where to go and when, and eventually they decided Snowbird Resort in Utah. We hope our work together as the Agile Alliance helps others in our profession to think about software development methodologies and organizations in new, more agile ways. If so, we've accomplished our goals. Brilliantly written, Jim. Great stuff. That is a very robust history of the Agile Manifesto. Now, let's talk about something else. We've talked about the Agile mindset. Let's talk about what is Agile Software Development. Now, this is from the Agile Alliance. Agile Software Development is different from general Agile, as I would call it. Agile software development is more than frameworks such as Scrum, XP, or FDD. Agile software development is more than practices such as pair programming, test-driven development, stand-ups, planning sessions, and sprints. Agile software development is an umbrella term for a set of frameworks and practices based on the values and principles expressed in the manifesto for agile software development and the 12 principles behind it. When you approach software development in a particular manner, It's generally good to live by these values and principles and use them to help figure out the right things to do, given your particular context. So, as I said in the very beginning, when you think about Agile, all of those iterative improvements that I talked about in the very beginning should generate the most favorable outcome. Maybe by now you've found how this way of thinking 
is founded on people, humans, interactions of individuals, giving our customer value. So agile does not mean software, IT, and technology. Yes, there's something called agile software development, as I just showed you on the previous slide, but that is not agile primarily. It can be used to develop software and systems, but that's not what it is. By the time I show you the Agile Manifesto, you'll be able to detect an Agile thinker and an Agile process, an Agile method, or an Agile framework a mile away using the simple Manifesto litmus test. And that, similar to what Jim Highsmith said in what we just read, is, does this fit the Agile description? Sometimes you get a process where people count the process as Agile, but it's not. Sometimes you get a big old lumbering fat framework that people try to push as agile, but it is not agile. Just taking a look at the agile manifesto, you'll know if it's agile or not. So I hope by now it's making sense why you should be agile. Agile is not for the strongest of the species. It's not about I'm the strongest. No. Agile is about those who are most adaptable to change. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most adaptable to change. Those are the ones who are truly agile. Now, why agile? Why not waterfall? Agile or waterfall? Well, this is encapsulated in the Stacy complexity model that you see on the screen. Also, sometimes referred to as a Stacy model. Now, on the y-axis right here, you have requirements. You're either close to agreement or far from agreement. So we'll put an R here for requirements. Here, we have technology, the technology process for whatever you're doing, the technological dimensions. You are either close to certainty about the technology process, the technology in and of itself, or you're far from certainty. Sometimes you've got no clue how to make a project happen. You don't understand how to code. You don't understand the language that you're going to be using to code because it hasn't even been written. Everything is so far out. In instances like that, Agile will thrive. Agile is best when there's high variability. So you could start off in the simple space on projects that are predictive in nature. And this is okay. We typically call this waterfall. It works best when the requirements are, watch this, close to agreement, and when we understand the technology we're working with, we're close to certainty about that. So being in the simple space is okay. There's nothing wrong in predictive projects. But a time comes when you begin to venture towards the complex world. And when you're venturing towards a complex world, you may even pass by complicated, right? Complicated does not mean complex. Complicated could mean Lots of different facets and steps. But if you follow the step one, two, three, four, all the way to thousand, you're going to get there. So complicated, we often use the example, Roy and I, of building a watch. Building a watch has a lot of steps. It's complicated. But we know where we want to arrive at. We know how we're going to arrive there. The technologies are not hard to understand. We know the technologies. It's been done before. It's predictive. Yes, even building a watch with all the thousand plus steps, yes. But when we talk about complex, complex means we don't really know how we're going to get there. We've got an idea of where we want to be, but we don't know how to get there. Simple as driving to Kamloops, British Columbia. Now, you might say, Phil, I've never been to Kamloops. That in and of itself is a challenge. Well, for those who know how to get there, they'll tell you. It's possible you may take different routes. It's not absolutely certain you're going to go one way. There are different ways. Now, let's talk about you driving to work. Do you know how you're going to get to work tomorrow? You've got an idea, of course, but what happens if you hit the, I don't know how you drive to work. Maybe you get on Main Street. Let's say there's traffic on Main Street. Let's say there's traffic on Broadway that you could use as an alternative. Now you're faced with complexities, things that you didn't foresee. Now you don't know how you're going to get to work. Maybe you'd get on the I-10. You see, it's changing. It's adaptable. It needs some agile think. And then you get into full-blown anarchy, chaos. This is where agile thrives. So agile is best 
when there's high variability, need to experiment to discover the best solution, and change is likely. However, you do need a lot of things to make it work. Big one, buy-in from management. Two, T-shaped skills. T-shaped skills pretty means broad set of skills, deep specialisms. And being co-located, it helps as well. These are some of the things you need to use with Agile. So when you take a look at the traditional way of managing projects, scope is typically fixed and schedule and budget are flexible. We estimate them, but we can change them. In the world of Agile, we flip that on its head. And now schedule and budget are fixed. We have a fixed time box. We have a fixed number of resources and scope is flexible. Now, I wish I could go into this a lot more, but we do that in our training. This is really more like an introduction to Agile. Agile is not just for IT. It's used everywhere. We have coached and mentored firms that are in product development, uh, oil and gas, engineering. Even the U.S. Air Force has been one of Roy's clients being trained and coached in the world of Agile. So everyone is thinking Agile. Governments are thinking Agile. It might amaze you that the UK government has a portal dedicated to Agile. It's on www.gov.uk forward slash service dash manual forward slash Agile dash delivery. I'm going to put a link below so you can check out the awesome UK government's repository for Agile. And believe it or not, the US government as well has a PDF document on Agile and they're asking for comments on it. And it's called Agile Assessment Guide, Best Practices for Agile Adoption and Implementation. So everyone knows Agile is not just for products. You could use it for services. You could use it for anything under the sun because it's a way of thinking. And you need to think to tackle problems. The PMI in the Agile Practice Guide on page 19 makes a case in this for why you should be on a continuum. In some instances, you might find yourself in a very predictive situation. In other instances, you might find yourself somewhere in between. Therefore, we see it as a continuum. We don't see it as black or white. Either you are predictive or you are agile. No, we see a variety of possibilities. So in addition to this, just to put some further context to this image, you have two other options, which I have not shown here. You have Agile all the way up here. And you have Incremental over here. So in other words, if you're working on a project with a low frequency of delivery and a low degree of change, absolutely nothing wrong in predictive. It's a one-time delivery. If you're working on a project that has a high degree of change, low frequency of delivery, you could think iterative. But if you're working on high frequency of delivery, high degree of change, this is where Agile will thrive. And of course, incremental can be used where there's a low degree of change, high frequency of delivery. We talk a lot more about that in our classes. So with all that said and done, let's talk about the Agile Manifesto. If you go to agilemanifesto.org, like I told you, not only will you be able to read Jim's brilliant article, you will also be able to read the Agile Manifesto Values and principles. So let's read the values first. We are uncovering better ways of developing products. Now, for those who are very used to the manifesto, you see that we have made a tweak. And this is Roy's handiwork here, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Because in today's world, it is not about software alone. We are uncovering better ways of developing product by helping it and helping others do it. So we made that tweak. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It's all about the humans. You get a better outcome when you think about humans. Work in product over comprehensive documentation. It's all about a product that works, not about reams and reams of paper and documents for a product that is no good or doesn't work. We're not saying documentation is not any good. But we're saying a working product will always trump documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. 
Think about collaborating with your customer as opposed to pointing to a contract and thinking about change orders after change order. Instead, think about working with your customer. Your customer may ask you to deliver a particular set of features, and you may feel this is not in the contract. Well, collaborate with them. Or maybe a customer wants an item that was not in the original contract. How about collaborating as opposed to saying, well, it's not in the contract and right off the bat, you're just thinking about money. That's a poor mindset. Remember I said it's a mindset? There's nothing here that talks about software development, is there? What about responding to change over following a plan? Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they are punched in the mouth. What happens? You're punched in the mouth. You got to respond to change. You see, this is a way of thinking. We also made a tweak here. So full disclosure, we made a tweak here to say work in product, not just software, but any product, any deliverable product, service, or result. And that is the mindset as far as the Agile Manifesto values are concerned. Now let's go a step further. Now that we've talked about a lot of this, let me once again highlight the brilliant website managed by the Agile Alliance. Go on down to Agile Alliance site and you'll be able to find the Agile Manifesto like this with the 12 principles. And right now we are going over the 12 principles. The very first principle states, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable product. In other words, deliver continuously. Delight your customer with value. Secondly, welcome changing requirements even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. You are on the customer's side. You're on the customer's team. If they ask for a change late in the day, you're not going to get mad because you're going to realize this is for our customer's competitive advantage. Number three, deliver work in product frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to a shorter time scale. Why do we want to deliver so frequently? Because it's a risk coping mechanism when you deliver in an iteration of two weeks or less, you are going to get your customer's feedback, which is valuable. And it's going to guide you as to whether you're on the right track. Number four, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. Now, Roy and I were training a group of individuals very recently. And one of them said, you know what? I have a problem with number four. I could work, you know, with my customers and business people once a week. But my goodness, daily? (laughs) And we told them, don't worry. We're not talking about working relentlessly every single day without purpose. When you meet, there's purpose. But when we look at Agile through a particular lens of one framework, for example, Scrum, we have a business person known as the product owner. And that individual is there to support and help the team and is a mouthpiece for the business. Number five, build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need. Trust them to get the job done. You already read from Jim's article. This is all about, you could call it mushy stuff, but we know that when we give the team what they need, the environment, the support they need, they get stuff done. When you don't give the team the nurturing, support, autonomy that they need, bad things happen. Number six, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face conversation. Face-to-face conversation is great. It's far-reaching, especially when you want to convey empathy, when you want to observe that body language to give you that understanding that the person truly is in the world of the person they're empathizing with. Read a little bit about Professor Emeritus Albert Morabian and his 553087 formula when you are trying to convey topics where there's empathy, where you really want to get the most of the emotional side of the communication, you've got to be thinking about face-to-face. 38% of communication in that respect can be gleaned from the tone of voice. 55, a huge 55, is from body language. And that is one of the reasons why number six holds true. Number seven, working product is the primary measure of progress. Your customers are not keen 
I know I'm 99.999%. I just have a tiny little bit left and I won't be done for another year. No, work in product, that shows progress. And that's why when we break down our work in iterations, we get a working PSI, we call it, potentially shippable increment, that delights the customer. It's not the full thing. It's a tiny little measure, but ultimately you're going to keep delivering value till you get the full thing. Number eight, agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Some people, when they read eight, they think the team needs to be flogged and beaten and driven. No, those are all bad ideas. Carrots and sticks, bad. Here, we're talking about reality. You have eight hours in a day. You know that two hours are not spent on the project typically. So be realistic. When you're thinking about the availability, the capacity of the team, you got to factor in reality. And all we're saying is if you commit to doing something, make sure you can actually do it without killing the team, without making the team go overboard. And I'm not saying over time, sometimes it's not necessary. But when a team is constantly made to, to put in 60 hours a week, you keep driving your team 60 hours, 60 hours, you're going to end up hurting the team. So we want sustainable development, something that's sustainable. Don't say, oh, yeah, we can deliver 100 story points by killing the team, huh? By pushing them over so there's no work-life balance. No, we don't want that. So we want a constant pace indefinitely, which means we have to base it on reality. We have to base it with the understanding that these are humans. Number nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. In other words, don't cut corners. You will be more agile by ensuring technical excellence, and then you will not have technical debt, which causes bad things to happen. Rework, defects, no, we don't want that. So while some people think agile is a rush, 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 they are so wrong. They got it wrong. Agile is to deal with uncertainty, and it is is respectful of technical excellence and good design. Number 10, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Now, this is the most difficult way of stating something simple. In other words, don't do unnecessary work. Keep it simple. Maximize the amount of work not done. But I can understand why it was written like this. There's a difference between maximizing the amount of work done versus maximizing the amount of work not done. And that needs to be a mindset. Be a maximizer of work not done because that is a lean idea. That is lean mindedness. That is cutting out the fat. Number 11, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Teams, when they are left to self-organize as a group of mature individuals, you hired the right people to start with. Wonders are going to happen when you let them have that autonomy. When you put on a servant leader hat, and instead of do this, do that, it is, how can I help you? This is really espousing leadership. I like a quote from Steve Jobs, and I'll paraphrase it. Steve says, management is making people do what you want them to do or what you think they should do. So it's written, here's the law, do this, do that, do that. That's management. But he said, leadership is making people do what they never even imagined they could do. In other words, they blew their own mind because you acted as a servant leader. You opened the gates for them to have that autonomy, for them to be able to be self-led, self-organizing teams. That is the height of leadership, servant leadership. And that's what we espouse in the world of Agile. Number 12, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective then tune and adjust its behavior accordingly. We're talking about something called a retrospective. And a retrospective is a safe space where we can look at what we did well, what we didn't do so well, and we can come clean as far as mistakes we made and be open with the team. And for that reason, we do not document, document, document lessons learned in this particular meeting. Instead, this meeting is for the team to come clean, to be honest, to be open, drop their guard, and find how to get better. And they take an item or two, and in the next iteration, they decide to improve on that area. And my friends, that is agile thinking, and that's the 12 agile principles. So agile has been said to be a lot of things, but it is not 
software development. So those of you who are in government, who are in organizations where Agile hasn't been embraced, I want to encourage you to go on down to that website I mentioned. I'm going to try to put links below. Also, if you are in the United Kingdom, go on down to that gov.uk site I talked about. If you're in the U.S., take a look at the Agile Assessment Guide and begin to see Agile as that, a way of thinking. On the Agile Alliance website, they've got a brilliant, brilliant mechanism here for you to learn Agile and for you to learn some of these definitions. It's done using a subway system arrangement, just like the underground, the London Underground. Just take a look at each one, go through it. It's great practice for those of you who are about to take a professional exam. So let's round up our little discussion today. So far, we've talked about Agile, talk about Agile as being primarily a way of thinking. We've taken a look at the Agile Manifesto values. We've taken a look at the Agile Manifesto principles. And Agile, in closing, is used in so many organizations. The truth is that out of all the organizations the PMI surveyed very recently, a full 71% of organizations reported using Agile approaches for their projects, sometimes, often, or always. I believe that number has grown since 2017. And do you know that out of those organizations that use Agile or approach projects from an Agile perspective, do you know that 70% of those actually use one framework in particular known as Scrum, very interesting. Now, the numbers for Scrum may be receding because people are becoming more creative and they're blending a lot of methodologies and getting into hybridized project management, mixing different agile, predictive approaches to get the best of both worlds. So my friends, that is it for today. I hope you found this to be helpful. In our next episode, we'll take a journey into discussing that framework that I mentioned, known as Scrum. See you there. Let's face it, not everyone learns in front of an instructor. Some people learn very well on their own. Others may learn by discussing the PMBOK guide with a trainer or coach. Others may learn by watching videos. If that sounds like you in any one of those instances, you need to go on down to praiseon.com. P-R-A-I-Z-I-O-N.com. We provide solutions for all modes of learning. Go on down see what we have in store. Let's get back into the show.